Well, thanks so much. It's a pleasure to speak with you all here today. I'm going to speak about mostly things that I started and did in Shaji Wang's lab, and I was a postdoc there. But uh, we're starting to take this in new, exciting directions with those wonderful people in my relatively new lab in Bristol. Uh, that's the best lab photo we have. It's very blurry, so you know it was a good night. Um, okay, so I want to know when you see the circle on the screen. So please just put your hand up when you see the circle. Time to go. It is there. It's not a trick. Okay. So I'm really interested in figuring out what just happened in your brain there that I have normal. I see the circle. He's not lying. Okay. Because the stimulus didn't change. The visual information didn't change in any kind of significant way. Some internal state of your brain must have changed to allow that sensory information into your conscious perception. And it turns out other people are interested in this. So Peter Rossum's lab in the Netherlands did a very similar experiment to this, but instead of using the neuroscientists as the model system, they studied macaque monkeys. And they uh, are very difficult to see stimuli, so that they could show the same stimulus a couple of times to a monkey, they don't see it about half the time, but they'll miss it about half the time. And some trials are sneaky and they don't show any stimulus, and they still get the monkey to respond as to whether or not it saw it. And it can correctly reject, or it can think it saw something, which is called a false alert, kind of hallucination. So one question that they were interested in is, if you put your electrodes recording in the brain, are, is the neural activity going to represent the objective physical reality of high activity if there was a stimulus there, and low activity otherwise? Or is it going to be more like the subjective perception which is high activity when the monkey perceives the stimulus and low otherwise. Actually, I'd like to know what you think. So maybe put up your hand if you think the brain encodes the objective reality and its fire words. What about the subjective experience? Okay, a lot of subjective. Okay, so when we put the electrode in V1, yeah, high activity for the hit and miss trial. So that's whenever the stimulus was shown, regardless of whether the monkey perceived it or not. So that's much more like the objective reality. And then they went and they moved their electrodes up towards the prefrontal cortex. And after a couple of hundred milliseconds, something pretty cool happened. And you started to get high activity whenever the monkey perceived the stimulus, regardless of whether it was really there or not. So this seems to be some sort of a transformation along the cortical hierarchy from encoding more strongly the objective uh, stimuli to the subjective experience. In this task, they did, yeah. Yeah, so in this task, you can't distinguish it, but our collaborator, Chris Sardar, has done some very really elegant experiments with humans um, trying to separate those two things. And basically what they found is that you have a very similar pattern of distributed frontal parietal temporal activity corresponding to the uh, perceptual awareness, but you don't get as much of that kind of pre-motor motor area activity when the motor preparation is not there. Okay. All right, so lots of studies looking at this type of thing have been done over the years. Some of them by Stas as the hands group is shown here. And it turns out that this difference between the uh, perceived and unperceived stimuli is uh, often correlated with a largely distributed pattern of activity across higher cortical areas including the frontal parietal cortex. So it really is a large scale cortical phenomenon, it seems, is perception. So we are interested in studying these types of phenomena by thinking about how particular features of the cortical anatomy can enable the dynamics that uh, enable perception and aspects of cognition. And usually when people are uh, giving the analogy for how cortical dynamics may work and how attractive states may form, they talk about balls rolling over hilly landscapes. But I think that's not the best analogy for cortical dynamics. I think it's actually more like a very light ping pong ball rolling over a sheet that is controlled like a marionette on some strings. Okay? It's 
still working on how to describe that in like three words. Okay, but this is basically the idea. So in this analogy, what is the puppeteer? What controls the strings? Maybe it's just because I'm also half Australian, but I'm kind of into Max Shine's idea of getting people to flip the way they look at things. And I think in this analogy, it's actually the subcortical structures that are pulling the strings on the cortical dynamical sheet. So here, the, in the way I'm thinking about it, the subcortical puppeteer controls the cortical dynamical sheet by activating gradients of receptors. And we have, we've seen in Max Shine's talk, the importance of the matrix thalamus. I think also different neuromodulators like the dopaminergic neurons from ETA and the serotonergic neurons from George Swafford. They're also going to affect these cortical dynamical sheet, but in ways that are specific to where their receptors are distributed on the cortical surface. How do you distinguish between cortex and epithalamus, like in the polar versus the escape of the cortex? Is that just because of what's experimentally addressable in these imaging studies, like cortex, or do you think that nerves are also just joined across both regions? Like, why is that very different? Yeah, there's a really good point. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess it is like one big recurrent system, right? but sometimes it's helpful to try and understand a uh, big system by breaking it down into acceptable components, right? And I come from an area where we tend to think about cortex first. And what I'm trying to do here is trying to think about how you can push the cortical dynamical landscape through bifurcations through into different um, uh, dynamical regimes, okay? And I think in this particular case, it can be helpful to separate these neuromodulatory and dynamic inputs from the cortex. However, really going forward, the cortical dynamics are going to affect those subcortical regions too. All right, so this uh, neuromodulators, I think they're going to have one of their effects through the receptors in the cortical circuits. So to understand what's going on, we need to really zoom in to, uh, to quite a fine level. But we're also interested in zooming out to cortex-wide activity during cognition. And in order to put these scales together, we're developing multi-scale brain network models of quite simple cognitive functions. And uh, we're not the first people to do this. Other groups like Michael Breakspear, Gustavo Deco have been doing this kind of things for years. But I think there's a slight uh, difference in emphasis in that they emphasized, certainly at the beginning, trying to replicate the resting state functional connectivity in the human brain, whereas we tend to focus more on cortex-wide activity during cognitive functions. Uh, another thing is that, certainly compared to the earlier studies, we try to implement a few more anatomical details. And that's actually quite a challenging task because different aspects of anatomy that we might want to bring into our models aren't readily compatible. They tend to be in slice data from different labs. They tend to be quantified, they are quantified in different cortical areas, different parcellations. So we teamed up with the wonderful neuroanalysts in Germany, Nicola Palomero Gallagher and her team. And using different neuroimaging and neuroanatomy techniques, uh, we put all of this different anatomical data and more into a common cortical space. And that led us to some anatomical findings about the organization of the contact brain, which you can see in these papers. But it was also really the anatomical foundation of a series of models, multi-scale models that we've developed uh, in uh, Shejun Wang's lab. And so how do we go about building these multi-scale models? Um, the first step is to build a local circuit model and put one of those in each brain area. And that's like the building block of our large-scale model. Okay, and I'm going to take you through what for our lab was a really foundational paper by Rishi Chaudhuri and Shejun back in 2015. And this has a very simple local circuit with just an um, interconnected population of excitatory and population of inhibitory cells. And simply activity is driven up by local inputs from the excitatory cells and down from uh, the inhibitory cell activity. And that's it for that study. That's the local building blocks. But then the next thing to make it a large scale model, you put one of those local circuit models in each cortical area that you have the anatomical data for. And to do that, we normally hang out with Henry Kennedy, great analyst in Leon, and Henry and his lab quantified the directed weighted connectivity between dozens of cortical areas in the macaque monkey. So because it's so beautifully quantified, we can just pop it straight into our equation to say how strongly an area Y is going to influence activity in another area X. 
We have a little parameter here, G, which just says how relatively strong the long range inputs are compared to the local inputs. Okay? But I think a really key innovation for this paper uh, was that they recognized that beyond the long distance connectivity, local circuit properties also change, sometimes systematically along the cortex. And that might be important functionally. And here they uh, went through many papers by Guy Austin and colleagues that showed that the number of dendritic spines on pyramidal cell basal dendrites in their three increased systematically along the cortical hierarchy. In fact, they increased by about tenfold between neurons in E1 up to neurons in prefrontal cortex. And these spines are where most of the excitatory inputs on the pyramidal cells are. So I think very reasonably they said, well, we should account for that in our models and we should increase the relative strength of synaptic inputs in our population rate models according to the spine bands of areas across the cortex. And I'm not going to go too far into the implications of this, because I think Xiao Jing is going to do that uh, in a much better way in a talk right after this. Uh, but I think it is functionally very important, and what this enables is different types of dynamics, different timescales of dynamics across different uh, networks and different regions of the cortex. And then really the last uh, step to build these models is to put in sensory stimulation into the sensory cortex, see how activity unfolds across the cortex, measure the activity, and compare it to experiments. So Elise Klatzman, who was a placement student with us in New York and a PhD student with me in Bristol, used exactly this method in order to try and simulate that consciousness experiment that we talked about a few minutes ago. And uh, these are the activity results for his models. For V1, you see something reasonably similar. You see this high activity for the objective stimulation of V1. But when you go up to the model's prefrontal cortex, you see the activity that looks a lot more like what correlated with subjective perception in the monkey cortex. Okay, so this is a multi scale model. So we can zoom right out and we can see how activity propagates across the monkey cortex during hit trials and missed trials. Okay, and what we see is that in the visual system, activity is very similar. Uh, however, only on the hit trials do you get this uh, large and more sustained frontal parietal activity. And in the conscious access field, they have termed this ignition. Okay, so we at least then went and wanted to simplify this right down to a two dynamical variable model. One excited tree population, one inhibitory to try and understand the dynamics of the what's going on. Now here we see an excitatory and an alkaline in red and an inhibitory nocline in blue. And they cross in three points. Okay? There are two stable steady states, one for low activity on the left, one for high activity on the right, and there's an unstable steady state in the middle, which acts as a kind of a threshold. And what the stimulus does, it only comes on for a very short amount of time, about 50 milliseconds, in the experiments I'm in the simulation, it transiently pushes up the excitatory nocline. So that for a very brief period, there's only one crossing of the two lines. So there's only one attractive state for the period that the stimulus is on. So what that does is we see this uh, simulated activity here. While the stimulus is on, activity progresses up to this high attractive state. And when the stimulus goes up, depending on whether this activity has gone past the threshold to the right or below to the left, it will go back down to the original attractor, low activity state, or up to the high activity state. And this is what we think is happening in uh, uh, essentially in a large scale system during this and hit trials. Now we've also seen by several people in this meeting analysis of uh, stability and dynamics and dynamic coding uh, within uh, individual trials. And uh, we did this analysis on our network. And basically this is a cross-temporal decoding technique. And you want to understand whether the same activity pattern across the cortex that predicts perception early in the trial will also predict it at other time points. And the way people uh, tend to visualize this is that if you see a diagonal red line for high classification accuracy, that means that the code is changing rapidly. There's a, there's a, it's predictable, but there's a dynamic code. However, if you see a red square like here, this is more stable coding. It means you can train in one time point and decode in another time point, meaning that the mirror parallels of perception are pretty much the same of this time. And we actually saw this dynamic to stable transition in, uh, in uh, coding here uh, in our simulations. And I think we understand why. 
This basically corresponds to the propagation of the stimuli of, this, of the information up the frontal parietal cortex before it gets uh, 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 drawn into the attractive state. So along the sensory hierarchy, uh, we have these peculiar, particular features of the connectivity and in our model, so that there's very strong feed forward connectivity that is uh, net excitatory. Whereas the feedback connectivity is more balanced. It's maybe slightly more regulatory, or you can think about it as modulating the, uh, the lower area activity. And this was a, a scheme proposed by Kurt Hayes in Shaijing recently. And this is actually a kind of asymmetric connectivity in the uh, early sensory hierarchy. And you can think about this as enabling kind of a hidden feed forward structure in the highly recurrent connectome. And we've seen uh, from different talks, including in Lucid Pereira's, how this, uh, these uh, feed forward connectivity, asymmetric connectivity patterns can enable sequences. And in this particular instance, the sequence is the propagation of neural activity along the cortex. However, when you get up to the frontal parietal network, you see much more symmetric patterns of connectivity. And this is exactly the type of recurrent symmetric connectivity that we want to maintain these distributed attractive states that we see in the frontal parietal network. And actually, there's several citations here from lots of people involved in the meeting that I think from many different angles, often in the mouse, some theory papers, some monkey, lots of people are finding these kind of asymmetric, systematic, or feed forwards or recurring patterns in different uh, aspects of anatomy and also often related to functions that work in memory. So I think that might be something interesting and real. So we still haven't talked about why some trials are hit trials and some trials are missed trials. And there are uh, one particular parameter in the model, which we call a vigilant signal, taking the name from the conscious access literature. And this is basically just a very weak excitatory modulation that we added to the associated cortical areas in some trials. And on the x-axis here, you can see the strength of the visual input to V1. And on the y-axis, you can see the detection rate fraction of trials in which the stimulus was detected. And as this vigilant signal increases from light blue to dark blue, for a given stimulus strength, you increase your detection rate. And because of the pattern of this, uh, this um, distributed weak excitation, we think perhaps it might be related to the matrix thalamus input that um, Max Schrein's group discussed uh, recently in the main talks. Um, so we think that perhaps this thalamic input might uh, make cause very quick transient shifts to the cortical dynamical sheet that will make it easier to go from one attractive state to another. And more recently, we've moved on to a more dynamic modeling of thalamocortical interactions. Uh, here in the context of mouse work in memory, we really simulated uh, 40 different, um, uh, uh, 43 different cortical areas and 40 different um, uh, nuclei, their interactions. And we were able to replicate many results, including one from Carlos Cavoda's lab, showing that when you inhibit the thalamus, it's able to shut down this distributed persistent activity underlying working memory. And another result from uh, Shi Yu here is that the mouse metoscopic connectome was able to support actually multiple distinct attractive states, not just this working memory one shown in the lab. And we suspect that these different attractive states could correspond to different cognitive networks. But in this paper, we weren't able to figure out how you move, how to bring shifts from one attractive state to another. So I think this is just one of several things that Lisa Pereira's framework, which you mentioned in the main cosine talks, can help us to solve. And uh, through this framework where we uh, focused on transient or dynamic gazing facilitated by the thalamus, um, we've shown that you can move between distinct large cognitive networks or attractive, attractive states. And uh, here we focused on different types of local and uh, inter-area connectivity. Like, like I mentioned previously, the symmetric connectivity, which is good for giving you these fixed point attractive states, uh, and the sequences, uh, the feed connectivity for uh, asymmetric connectivity, which is good for giving you sequences. And um, this is mentioned this in the main talk, but we think this might be a pretty neat explanation for how you can have persistent motor preparation signals in areas like premotor cortex that don't actually need to move them, not for a while. However, uh, in, in our model, the reason this happens is because you have um, symmetrically connected 
free motor area that are able to maintain this um, motor preparation signal. And they target asymmetrically connected units in the motor cortex, but not quite strongly enough to initiate high activity in those units, unless they also receive a transient thalamic input that's aligned with those cortical cortical connections. So essentially we're developing, along with other groups who are working on similar things, theories of dynamic data for cortical cortical interactions by the thalamus. So the thalamus used to do these quite rapid and very interesting shifts of cortical cortical dynamic landscape. But we're also interested in neuromodulators, which might uh, lead to more long-lasting sustained changes in the dynamic growth landscape. And our work here is very much inspired by experimental work by Amy Panston. So we went back to the receptor data, uh, Nicola Palomero's receptor data. And here we found uh, initially that actually the dopamine D1 receptor expression is not in any way uniform across the cortex. In fact, it increases very strongly in the cortical hierarchy. So we have more dopamine modulation in prefrontal and parietal cortex than in the sensory region. So we've known for a long time that dopamine in prefrontal cortex is very important for working memory. But here we see that dopamine has these very distributed effects across the cortex. So we wanted to explore that. And we did this with a slightly more complex uh, local circuit model with three types of inhibitory neurons. And the reason we did that was because this old work from Gao and Golden McKeach showing that dopamine can actually shift the focus of inhibition in a cortical circuit from around the soma up to the dendrites. And we thought that might be interesting for gating of information into organ memory. There's also another effect of dopamine increasing NMDA dependent excitation. So here we're going to show a simulation where we show the circuit a red target stimulus and there's a delay. It's going to remember the stimulus through the delay and it should ignore a blue distracted stimulus. And we're going to show stimulus specific activity across the cortex that's red or blue according to whether it's related to the target or the distractor. So when the target comes on, we start to see this propagation of target related activity go through the visual network and engage the frontal parietal or the memory network. Then when the distractor comes on, that gets propagated through the visual system too, but it's not able to dislodge this memory of the target stimulus from the frontal parietal or working memory network. So now we have this distributed pattern of activity across the cortex. We better check if it's actually in any way reasonable. So Lieber and colleagues have done a um, meta-analysis of over 90 experimental studies, and they showed where the persistent activity in working memory studies was in the attack cortex. And it turns out a model actually got it pretty much bang on. Another thing we notice is that when you increase the dopamine level to just the right amount, you're able to shift the network from a distractible working memory regime to one that's much more distractor resistant. And by zooming in the local circuit, we were, uh, we were able to simulate an optogenetic inhibition experiment by inhibiting the dendrite target in each of your at the time of the distractor stimulus. And we were able to shift the network back from being distractor resistant to being distractible. So it seems that in our model, at least, dopamine blocks distracting stimuli from entering the working memory network by enhancing dendritic inhibition in the frontal parietal network. Uh, briefly, for the working memory hardcore people here, we're not completely dismissing activity silence mechanisms either. In fact, we, we saw that you could do that on a large scale. We found it was a bit more distractible. And we saw that by releasing dopamine, you can actually shift between these activity silent and persistent activity modes of working memory in the and briefly, we've just gone, started to go on to other neuromodulators in uh, recent times. And uh, this is a work that came out in the summer. We looked across over 109 areas of the MACAP cortex, and we looked at the expression of 14 different receptor types, again, in Nicola Palomero-Gallagher's data. And we found these two major axes that describe all this complex data really well. And we color coded the areas here according to the cognitive networks that, uh, that they belong to, the sensory networks in purple and blue, and the higher cognitive networks in the other colors. And what we see is that the sensory networks tend to be to the left of this axis, this horizontal axis, and the cognitive networks to the right. So this seems to be a kind of sensory cognitive axis of receptor expression along the cortical hierarchy. 
And when we dug into what that meant for the uh, anatomy, this uh, these this uh, increase the number of receptors per neuron, they fourfold along this axis. These neurons were able to have more receptors because they had bigger dendrites. And uh, similar to panels and stuff, uh, we found that this receptor uh, expression was anti correlated with the myelin expression. And we saw that both across cortical areas and cortical layers. So, with this increase in receptor expression along the sensory polymer axis, is enabled by larger dendrites and less myelin. Uh, lastly, we looked at the other axis and we saw a lot of red regions at the top here. And these red regions belong to the default mode network. And the default mode network in human cognitive neuroscience is active when people have internally driven cognition, so things like imagination and episodic memory recall. These green regions, which tend to cluster down towards the bottom right, uh, at the other end of this axis, these belong to the dorsal attention network, which is active in, in the opposite case when your attention has to be on the external stimuli. And when we looked into the receptor signature of this axis, we found that the main difference was in serotonin receptor expression, particularly in the 1A receptor, which is very high in the default mode network and low in the dorsal attention network. And there was perhaps a bit of a trend for the 2A receptor going in the other direction. So we speculate, and it is speculation at this stage, that perhaps serotonin may have mediated competition between sensory perception and internally generated thoughts via interactions with these networks. And we don't know how this works at the local circuit level yet, so we've begun uh, collaborations with neurophysiologists at the University of Bristol, led by Rahul Gupta and Ross Purple, and hopefully we'll make some progress on that soon. So to conclude, uh, we think that subcortical inputs from things like the thalamus and serotonergic and dopaminergic neurons transiently warp cortical connections and the dynamical landscape in a spatial pattern dictated by the receptor expression, enabling information to be rapidly reloaded across the brain during cognition. And uh, just to bring home the analogy, we think this subcortical puppeteer controls the cortical dynamical sheet by activating gradients of receptors. Uh, and with that, I want to say thank you very much to my postdoc mentor, Shao Jun Wang, collaborator Nicola Palomero Gallery, all of these other collaborators uh, who played a great role in these papers, the new group, and the funders. And thank you for listening.